So I'm here to talk to you today about a real-time time series analytical platform that we've built in-house at Uber called Apollo. Uh, forgive the mythological name. Naming is really hard. Uh, a little bit about my background. So I've spent almost three years at Uber, um, all of that time on the data engineering team. My first year at Uber uh, built out the predecessor to the system that I'm here to talk to you about today, and then the past two years building and shipping this system. Uh, before that, I was at Rackspace, where I worked on an open source time series database built on top of Cassandra, uh, and this is called Blue Flood. Um, so we'll start with the motivations for the system and the sort of context in which it was built. Uh, we'll touch on some of the applications that use it today, uh, and then we'll dive into the technical details around that implementation. Um, I'll talk about how we get the data in, how we store it, uh, and then the most interesting part by far, which is the, the query and caching layer. And then we'll, we'll wrap up by covering some of the challenges and pitfalls that we hit along the way. Uh, I'll leave time at the end for questions, um, so if you could please hold those for then. Um, so the initial goal was to serve business metrics. Um, this is metrics related to trips, drivers, riders, financials, et cetera. Um, and we wanted this to be in real time. And this, really means real-ish time. Um, it mean, real time means different things for business metrics than for system metrics, at least for our business. Um, think about it this way. An example of an actionable metric could be something like surge being high in some physical area. And the, the action that you might take in response to that would be to, to physically reposition supply in the real world. And to do that, your, your sort of response time is going to be on the order of minutes, not seconds, like it could potentially be for like system metrics. Um, so that allows our ingest latencies to be a little bit more lenient. So at this point, we're running with a P99 uh, ingest latency somewhere between one and a half seconds on the lower end of, of, of sources and three minutes uh, on the higher end. And this depends on the ingestion source. Um, the second key, key point is time series aggregates. So we aren't storing the entire history of all time worth of data. You know, for that, there's other systems that exist. Our, this is just for business metrics, and most of those have really strong seasonality components and are looked at in that context. You know, for example, weekday morning commutes have very different marketplace dynamics than, let's say, you know, Friday nights downtown. Um, we aren't an online store or a source of truth but a source for aggregated data. Um, you know, an example query of this form would be like hourly count of trips in San Francisco. Um, and the whole system was designed and optimized for aggregated data, not individual records of any sort. Um, the third key point here is, is geospatial. So we are a distributed business operating across the physical world, um, and we need to be able to provide granular geospatial slicing and dicing of that data to help analysts understand you know, various marketplace properties of some geotemporal segment of data. Um, you know, knowing that somewhere in San Francisco that, that the unfulfilled rate of requests went up at a particular point in time is not useful as compared to understanding that for example, AT&T Stadium, you know, when some sports game let out, then there was a, a sort of spike um, you know, associated with that increase in demand. Um, so what, what is Apollo? Um, you know, Apollo is real-time analytics platform. And, and let's talk a little bit about its properties. So we store only recent data. Uh, for us, that's about seven weeks worth. We have low latency on ingestion on the order of seconds to minutes between data being logged and that data being available for query. Uh, we support ad hoc exploration of data, arbitrary drill down, including geospatial filtering and, and geospatial dimensioning of our data. Uh, another key property is deduplication. So we use Kafka pretty heavily at Uber. Um, and our Kafka deployment, we, we end up getting a at least once delivery guarantee from. But one of the flaws in the, the existing system that we replaced with Apollo was that it would double count in a lot of scenarios involving timeouts or hardware software failures. Um, and we needed to be able to assert that a uniquely identifiable record exists exactly once and would not be double counted um, with, with this system. Uh, and we do all of this at, at pretty low latency to the end user. Uh, we'll cover stats at the end, but we operate with sub-second P99 and sub-100 millisecond P95 on, on the queries that we serve in production today. Um, OK, so let's, let's talk about how it's used. I'll, I'll talk about one example from each of three sort of different classes of front-end applications using Apollo today. 
Um, so here is an example of an internal dashboarding tool. Um, here's one that's used relatively broadly internally. Um, it's used by a large portion of our operational team daily and gives a number of metrics across a configurable duration of time and set of filters and provides seasonality comparisons. Um, you know, when, every, when all of the metrics are fully expanded, it's querying for about 40 to 50 metrics on page load. Uh, and we have to be able to support that you know, without a user sort of changing tabs or context switching. So it has to be near instant page load times for that. Uh, this is sort of a ad hoc drill down um, query front end. Um, so this allows you to configure, save, store, and execute queries that are compatible with our custom query language. And I'll, I'll talk more about this later and we'll actually revisit this slide, but this covers that, that sort of data exploration use case. Uh, and then we've also powered a number of like shorter lived sort of vanity tools for events like New Year's. Um, you know, here we showed a globe based heat map of trips happening in real time on, on New Year's Eve. Um, okay, so before we dive into the technical implementation, let's cover some of the requirements that defined the decision making process around our, our implementation. Um, since we're dealing with time series aggregates, we need to pick some timestamp attribute on the data to use for all of our bucketed aggregations. And we, we have the requirement that we support a timestamp that does not have strong ordering with respect to its arrival time. So an example of this is using the point in time that a trip was requested at for its, its bucketed aggregations rather than the time that the trip was completed at. But we don't have all the information about a trip until it is complete, so we end up with out of order arrival with respect to data timestamp. Um, also, that trip needs to remain mutable. Uh, for example, people commonly rate their last driver whenever they take their next trip, which could be you know, days or weeks later. Uh, the second key, key point is to have sublinear performance impact of scaling the, the queries per second. So scaling infrastructure is really hard. Um, and this is because growth comes across you know, multiple axes. You know, as your business grows, you've got more users issuing more queries. The cardinality of those queries increases as your users find new ways to look at data. Uh, you're storing more data sets as additional business units are spawned. And you, the size of each one of your data sets grows over time. So we needed to prepare for every six months passing, meaning double the users issuing 20% more queries split across twice as many data sets, which are each twice as large. Um, and we needed to do this without like a 10x hardware footprint every six months. Um, so we built a custom query language and query evaluator so that we can do you know, query canonicalization and leverage uh, partial result caching in order to avoid that sort of hardware footprint growth. Okay, let's talk about the details uh, technically. I'll dive into each one of these components, but here's the high-level mapping of all the components involved. At the top, we've got ingestion. We run streaming ingestion from Kafka, batch backfills from Hive using Uzi scheduled Spark jobs. We write that data into MemSQL, an in-memory SQL database. Um, beyond ingestion, we've got two services that talk to MemSQL. One is a query layer, and the other can be thought of as a sort of uh, like distributed cron tab for database operations. It does things like exp expiration of data, denormalization, collection and reporting of metadata, et cetera. So this diagram can be thought of as a view of a single data center. In each data center, we run a couple environments with the repeated diagram components here having environment specific deployments and the non-repeated components having a single deployment that's shared across all environments within that data center. So we run five, well, more than five, but this illustrates the approach we're, we're sort of in the process of migrating towards. Um, you know, we run in multiple data centers for redundancy, you know, in case there's a natural disaster or some other data center level failure scenario. And in each, we run a, a production prime environment. And this contains customers with larger data sets um, that require more storage. And we've also got a, num a, a smaller cluster in each for customers with lower storage requirements. Um, as well as a staging slash pre-production environment. So our ingestion comes from two sources, Kafka and Hive. Um, on the Kafka side, we run a custom Golang-based ingestion code that we wrote in-house for the project. And on the Hive side, we use a Scala code base leveraging Apache Spark. We actually used to use Spark streaming and ran into a number of performance issues that I'll, that I'll actually cover at the very end um, and ended up with 10 plus X performance gains by, by just writing our own in Golang. Um, 
So our ingestion jobs are really, really basic. Um, they support only very simple transformations, like converting a string UUID to its binary representation for, for space saving purposes. Um, we can apply standard filtering logic to restrict what rows have written to the database. And, and every job is just one input stream to one or more output tables. We do no stream merging or joining inside of the ingest code, but instead do all of that joining inside of the database. Uh, we run one job instance per environment, and this is in order to isolate failure or degradation in scenarios. Um, so here's a copy of what the ingestion logic would look like in terms of pseudocode. For each output table a given job has, we apply the filters for that table, map some transformations to each row, batch up those rows, and write them to a database. Super simple. Um, all of the writes that we perform are upserts. We make really heav heavy use of SQL's on duplicate key syntax, and we store our data in MemSQL, use it, which we have configured with asynchronous replication with a replication factor of two. So because we're relying on async replication, we can lose unreplicated writes when there's you know, a hardware failure. Um, so our fix for this is we just upsert the past 72 hours of data in bulk every six hours. It's you know, a cheap hack, but it makes sure that we get all of the data in without failure. So and in practice, single node failure scenarios and larger clusters, the fraction of rows that you lose is actually small enough that when you're serving aggregate data out, um, the, the aggregate data is being served between that failure point and backfill time is within an acceptably small margin of error. Um, so MemSQL is where we store the data. We investigated some of the alternatives during the research and planning phase, but MemSQL really serves our needs pretty well. Um, it's super fast, supports ingestion error rate significantly beyond our, our actual requirements, and it meets our reliability needs. Um, so um, another feature that we use of it that, that we've started using actually somewhat recently is they provide a uh, on-disk column store as well as the in-memory row store. Um, so we started moving some of the older data into columnar storage periodically, which can reduce storage costs by like 90 plus percent in some cases. Um, so our, our caching layer uh, stores partial result sets inside of sharded MySQLs. Um, you know, the goal here is to just reduce redundant, wasteful work. Uh, if a user comes along and asks, OK, what's the, the, the number of trips that happened in the past week broken down by hour? And then they come along you know, an hour and a half later and ask the same thing. We really don't want to have to go back to, to MemSQL and tell it to crunch all of that from the raw data all over again. So instead, we can pull like six and a half days from the cache and you know, half a day from MemSQL itself. Uh, and this reduces latencies you know, pretty, pretty dramatically. Um, okay, so let's, let's talk about how the actual query language and, and caching component work. Um, we'll start with the query language. So we built this, this custom meta language to be used as, as the point of interaction with the system, and we call it Apollo Query Language, or AQL. Um, it's an analytical time series query language. So it'll become more clear exactly what that means as we cover examples. Um, some of the goals influencing the design were, were for it to have a similar degree of flexibility and expressivity as, as, as SQL itself. Um, but we really didn't want to provide raw SQL access to our, our users. Um, it's really hard to trust users to write good SQL, and there's a lot of issues that can come out of providing raw, unfettered SQL access. And I'll, I'll cover some examples of both of those in, in a few slides. Um, we want it to be really easy to use and for there to be a like, really low learning curve for someone who already knows SQL. Um, so we support SQL expressions within, within the format, and we also support concepts like joins that, that you know, people are familiar with. Um, and so for our caching layer to be really effective, we need to be able to canonicalize queries. For example, count one and count star are semantically you know, identical. Um, a, a join condition of where foo equals bar versus where bar equals foo, or that foo not equal true and not foo, you know, are, are some of the, the sort of examples of canonicalization that we're, we're able to provide. Um, so in order to do that, though, we need to be able to parse from the input format into some intermediate format and then generate SQL from that. So by structuring AQL to be as close to that, that intermediate format as possible, we eliminate a lot of the, the potential complexity from the implementation that we would have had to deal with if, if we had made, let's say, SQL itself be the input format. 
Um, so one of the other features of AQL is the way that we perform validation of query semantics beyond what is typically offered by raw SQL. Um, so by storing some amount of semantic metadata in the query layer, so things like cardinality information, we can reject queries that would, you know, for example, attempt to join multiple tables on incompatible values or have an extremely high cardinality group by, um, things like that. Um, and we, we also wanted to be able to support automatic optimizations. So I'll, I'll cover those in a few slides. Let's, let's talk about an example. Um, so I guess it's sort of hard to read, um, but here is an example AQL query. So at the top we've got the base table. Um, we've got support for joins, dimensions, measures, filters, time filtering, and time zone information. Joins are, are just specified in terms of a table name and a join condition. Dimensions, which are essentially you know, a, a group by statement in SQL, are defined in terms of the, the basic case as the, just the SQL expression which composes it. Uh, we have support for also time-based and numeric bucketizers, like histograms. Um, in this particular example, we just have a time-based bucketing applied, where the user has, has requested time to be bucketed by day and returned in terms of a millisecond since epoch value. Uh, measures are the values that the user is, is interested in and, and are defined in terms of SQL expressions and optional filters that may apply only to that particular measure, which is useful for cases where a user might want multiple measures uh, that have different filters and do some sort of aggregation like dividing those two numbers by one another. Um, row filters are applied across all of the measures. Uh, in this case, we're filtering the base table and we're filtering the join table. Um, in this particular example. Uh, the time filter lets users specify in a natural language format the, the range of time that they're interested in. And we also support time zones. So here is the, uh, the query builder slide again. Um, and, and so rather than forcing users to write out queries like that by hand, we built this web UI for it. Um, and as you can see, the form is structured pretty similarly to, to our previous example query. Um, Okay, let's talk about some of the, the pitfalls of SQL that AQL has attempted to avoid. Um, okay, so daytime handling is really obnoxious in SQL. Uh, by making time series aggregation a first class concept, we can do a little bit better. So using the time dimension configuration from our previous example, the user specified that they want their aggregated data bucketed by a field called request at into one day buckets they want those day buckets aligned to the America Los Angeles time zone, and they want the final result to render the time values as, as numeric integers representing number of milliseconds since epoch at, at which each day bucket began. So let's look at what this would look like in SQL. So in SQL, we end up um, snapping the timestamps to the nearest 15 minute using modular arithmetic. And I'll get into exactly why we do this in, in a slide. Um, then we convert from milliseconds to seconds, then uh, convert from Unix timestamp into a SQL date time, then apply the time zone, then we do date time truncation to the day boundary, then we parse that day boundary truncated time, apply time zone information again, convert into a Unix timestamp, and finally back into milliseconds. So the, the syntactic sugar that we provide for date time handling allows users to not really have to worry about any of those, those details. And in a slightly more complex example of time handling, and one that shows another example of our, our syntactic sugar that we provide, um, let's say that the user wanted to join the, their base table against some dimension table containing time zone information, then use that time zone for the conversion. So we'd handle this like so, and add an implicit join to the relevant dimension table based on the key specified. So this is useful for scenarios where someone might want to query to see like a specific holiday. Let's say if you wanted to know how many trips occurred on Halloween. Every time zone has a different period of absolute time that represents the day of Halloween for them. Um, okay, let's, let's talk about when you, you want to divide one count by another. So each of these counts has a separate filter criteria. Doing it in raw SQL is significantly more verbose and complicated than specifying an array with two measure definitions, each one of those measure definitions just being composed of SQL expression of count and the relevant filter. Um, OK, so let's, let's talk about why, why SQL is really hard for time series OLAP 
for for you know another another pitfall here. So a user might want trip counts by geofence for geofences A, B, and C. So in, this is pretty simple. In SQL, select count, geofence UUID, you do the join, where the geofence UUID in A, B, and C. OK, what about total number of trips that are in geofence A, B, and C? So you might say select count from trips, join geofences, where geofence UUID in A, B, and C. You basically just got rid of the group by. So that's wrong. Uh, in this case, you're overcounting any trip that is present in multiple geofences. Instead, what you want to be doing is you know, select a count from where it exists, then you do a subquery pulling all of the, the uh, you know, geofences and geofence UUID in A, B, and C. And you know, a, a user may not sort of immediately recognize that and end up making incorrect business decisions based upon that. Um, you know, invalid query. So, okay, let's talk about bad queries. Um, select count, request at from trips, group by request at. So, request at is, is milliseconds since epoch. So, that's going to be super high cardinality and do terrible things to your query layer and probably your database. Um, so, grouping by milliseconds makes no sense. Um, and we would just reject this flat out. Uh, select count, fair total, group by fair total. Fair total is a float. That doesn't really make sense. Um, this should be reported as a histogram and bucketed. Um, select the sum of fair total from trips, comma, other table, where some condition on trips, some condition on other table. OK, so you forgot to do, you know, set up your, your join condition. So you've, you've done a Cartesian product. And that's going to do terrible things to your database and probably your query layer. So OK. So we, We've covered how we reject queries. Let's, let's talk about some of the other optimization that we're, we perform, um, specifically with regard to time. So if you wanted to snap to, let's say, three-hour buckets, uh, you might use something like the SQL above, which is a relatively complex set of conversions and operations. And the naive way to run your query would be to just use that in a select and group by that. But this causes that full set of date time uh, conversion functions to be run on every single row within the filter criteria for your query. If instead you were to do multi-stage aggregation, where you first do an inner select and you do one round of aggregation where you use just modular arithmetic to snap to 15-minute boundaries, then you apply the complex set of, of date conversion functions to your intermediate results, your database does way less work since the cardinality of elements that you're, you're doing the complex operation on is, is so drastically reduced. Um, so, okay, let's talk about how we do the sort of, how we break down time into sort of individually cacheable components. Um, so let's say a user wants the current week-to-date count of trips, and they run that query one day, 13 hours, and 17 minutes into the week. We'll, we'll actually break that query down into smaller time units that look something like this. And we do this because the alternative of, of not decomposing time into smaller cacheable units would result in way higher cache miss rates because your, your requested unit is not of a standard size. And every minute that passes means that it's a new, different size. Um, so we break it down into one day unit, 13 hour units, a quarter hour unit, and two minute units. And we can quickly check the cache for all of these units, then query the database for only the data uh, that, that we had a, a sort of cache miss on. Um, here's another example of a query where someone wants data grouped by week for a range of 20 days ago until 12 hours ago. On the left side, we're pulling five one-day units that, that compose the, the partial week. Um, and then we pull the two complete week units, and we compose the current partial week using a, a combination of largest possible units, which would not exceed it, it, its size. So one of the, the key factors in why our caching is able to be effective um, is the, the recomposition process that we, we just talked about. So we need to be able to do roll-ups on those cached values in order to make this work. Um, for count distinct queries, for example, we use hyperloglog. Um, that lets us combine multiple smaller aggregates into a single larger aggregate without actually having to query the database again for a new distinct count um, for that larger aggregation period. Um, when users query for average, behind the scenes, we'll, we'll actually rewrite that query and issue a separate count and sum query. Um, and this lets us do roll-ups at a later point in time. 
uh, which wouldn't be possible with just two average values on their own. Um, so let's take this uh, SQL query, for example. Um, average fare, time bucketed, and let's look at, at it across a few granularities. So grouping by 15-minute um, buckets for one hour, we'll look at 15-minute uh, buckets for 24 hours, and we'll look at 24-hour buckets for 21 days of data. And let's say that we've got a templated dashboard where users will look at this metric for a single city at a time. But we've got lots of users, each of them in different cities, and, but only in the context of one city at a time. Um, so you've got a couple of different ways that you can, you can actually crunch the data for this metric. The first way is in yellow, which is to just run it for the requested city using a where city equals x filter. In red, we see the, the total execution time if we were to run in serial that yellow query for all of the cities. And in blue is the alternative, which is to move city from a filter to a group by. And the numbers are, are slightly uh, adjusted for the presentation, but are representative of actual test results um, when we were building the system. So timing information doesn't tell you the complete story when it comes to actual utilization of, of computational resources, but it's a decent proxy in cases where you know, the, the shape of, of the, the actual resource utilization doesn't drastically change between queries. You know, for example, you aren't running one query that's disk bound, another query that's network bound, and another one that's, that's storage bound, um, but instead all of your queries are using sort of the same, the same resources. Um, so, since we do our, our storage and most of our heavy lifting with the, with the database, and the database resources are our primary latency bottleneck, let's just sort of think of utilization in terms of time spent running queries versus total time. Um, you know, thinking about it that, the takeaway is that it's, it's better in terms of our, our total cluster utilization to run a group by city and serve many users uh, rather than running one where city equals x query per user city. Um, and as you can see, looking at the table from left to right, the break-even point changes depending on the time frame being queried and the granularity of, of time series aggregates. So, you know, our, our, the sort of takeaway for us was that if, let's say that we had a, a cache miss for one city, and we knew that that query pattern is common enough that we're, we're going to probably see that, that same time range but parameterized for a different city, um, we, we can do some optimization there. So we would run the, the user's query as initially par parameterized, and then just to give them the lowest latency possible in their response, then asynchronously we kick off another query that, that does a group by and fills in the cache for that metric at that particular time range and granularity. So let's do some quick math here. You know, at this point, you've spent 250 milliseconds between one execution of the yellow query and one asynchronous execution of the blue query. If you end up getting a cache hit for four other cities during this time range in granularity, you've broken even on, on that sort of bet of, of doing that, um, that second query. So, and if you get more than four, you've actually come out ahead in terms of, of total utilization. So one other related property that I'll get into is the case where you're pulling multiple metrics from the same set of rows. For example, count of trips, sum of fares, average fare, average ETA. Um, you know, the first thing is that you're better off querying for all of those things at once with a single query rather than running a separate query for each. You know, this is probably seems pretty obvious, but there's, there's plenty of cases in the real world where your users are actually going to do suboptimal things just for simplicity of integration. You know, like uh, think about a dashboarding application. Your, your sort of naive implementation would be to issue a query per displayed metric, you know, treating each metric as a discrete independent unit. And it's not super realistic to expect the developers of, of that dashboarding application to build some complex query batching and rewriting component that figures out the ideal combination and restructuring of those requests. So the second optimization in, the, in this particular example is by rewriting average into sum and count, we can then you know, process that average calculation server side, um, which lets us completely remove the average calculation from, from what we're sending to the database. So we took these, these sort of concepts and found the most common query patterns that, that users were actually using. And we had a pretty basic heuristic for it initially, but there's some really interesting things we're actually working on now for automatic detection of these, these common patterns. 
Um, and we set up a system that would periodically run through those queries at various combinations of, of granularity and dimensions uh, in order to sort of pre-fill the cache. Um, you know, one of the first issues we ran into with, with this, this sort of contract runner, as we called it, uh, once we started adding the most common query patterns, was just the, the sort of combinatorial explosion of dimensional combinations. So assuming users can filter a metric across just three dimensions, uh, you know, that becomes eight possible query combinations, including the null set. So we also needed to be able to provide data at variable geographic resolution. So if you take those eight combinations, four of them have a city, and we ha let's say that we have seven scopes of geographical resolution um, sort of listed at the bottom. So multiply four that had a city times seven, and you get 28. Add the four from the non-city dimensions, and all of a sudden we're at 32 queries. So let's say that we also wanted to do it across four different time granularities, uh, quarter hour, hour, daily, weekly. So multiply by four again, and you're at 128 queries you'd have to run to populate that, the, the cache. So we, we then decided to just implement roll-ups into the, the contract runner itself um, so that we could just run one query with everything moved into group buys and then do all of that work in, in sort of the, the um, you know, processor server side um, outside of the database to generate the, the sort of 128 query result sets. Um, so this let us sort of cross out all of these things from what we're actually querying the database for. Um, okay, so let's, let's cover stats real quick. Um, so at this point, our P80 is sub 10 milliseconds, P90 sub 50. Um, I mean, you, you can read the rest. We're doing millions of queries a day. Uh, we've, since sort of the system has come online, we've served about 250,000 distinct queries. Um, and billions of, we're, we're doing billions of MySQL writes per day at this point. Um, so some of the things that we're working on next would be self-service onboarding schema management. Um, it turns out like the, the sort of operational burden of a system like this is, is one of the, the larger costs. Um, so schema change management and automation, uh, once you're running like five to 10 different environments, it becomes a huge pain in the ass to manage schema changes across all of them. Um, and we also want to build out sort of cost accounting so we can understand what users are, are actually you know, costing large amounts of computational or, or storage um, resource utilization, uh, automation around contracts so that we can detect what queries are, are run often enough that it's worth prefilling the cache versus not, um, and better query cost estimation for rejecting um, sort of bad queries. Um, so, we're running a little low on time, and I want to leave some time for questions, so I'll sort of skim through some of the challenges. Um, we had a lot of challenges around schema, because we're, we're managing like five different schemas. Uh, one for sort of the, the Hive schema, then the transformations on top of that, the Avril encoded Kafka schema, transformations on top of that, uh, the MemSQL schema, which is like a SQL DDL statement, the query layer schema, which is like the semantic metadata that we use for rejecting queries, et cetera. Um, and what we ended up doing in the end was just generating one sort of meta schema file and then generating all of the separate schemas from that. And that way, at least, we only have to edit one place uh, and, and sort of all of the changes will be propagated across all representations of, of that schema. Um, you know, another thing that we did that uh, was a huge performance gain for us was replacing Spark streaming. Um, so for, for our jobs, we were spending almost all of our CPU time on serialization and deserialization. And because of the way that we have multiple output destinations for a single input, Spark Streaming would either reread the source data from Kafka per output destination, um, it, and this is if we don't call .cache ever, or if we do call .cache, 
it would spend all of its time serializing that data after read, then deserializing per output destination. And the best performance that we were actually able to achieve with it was to deserialize from Kafka into a struct containing the, un like the set union of fields used across all of those output tables, apply any filters that are common across all of the output tables, then call cache on that collection. And even with that, we felt that there was like a ton of inefficiency. And I'll, I'll get into numbers in the next slide on exactly how much inefficiency. Um, but lots of overhead from Spark and the JVM in this case. You know, one other issue that we had was the way batching works. So you read a micro batch at a time from Kafka, and this micro batch is composed of you know many many partitions. We'll call them like micro micro batches, and each one of those partitions has to fully complete its execution before any container can start working on a new unit of work. So your processing speed just becomes limited by your, your slowest actor in the system, um, and and you end up wasting a ton of resources just sitting around idle, waiting for the slowest fraction to complete. Um, yeah, let's see. I'm going to skip over one more example of why Spark was bad for us. Um, so for our largest job, and we're running 70 plus at this point, total across our environments, um, we, we saw a difference of going from 160 CPU cores to eight, uh, 226 gigs of memory to 16, um, and throughput almost doubled. Um, and so for, for us, it was, it was hugely worth like the month that it took to sort of rewrite all of our ingestion and migrate it. Um, okay, so let's, let's uh, do questions. So the state of the world is that there, there were other data tools. Uh, OK. Um, the question was, what was the state of the world at Uber that caused you to decide to write your own query language? Um, so the state of the world was that there, there were other existing tools that it had allowed raw SQL access at one point in time. And those tools frequently had problems because of that. People would run you know, examples of those, those queries that I had done. I mean, I've, I've caused one of our internal databases to seg fault before accidentally, you know, and this is being relied upon by thousands of people. Um, so we wanted to ensure quality of service for, for everyone, um, and we wanted to actually do what was easiest for us, which was for, for us to implement the caching that we wanted um, and do the sort of canonicalization. It's really hard to parse SQL into a sort of canonicalized intermediate format and then back out to SQL, but if we understood what we wanted that intermediate format to look like, and then just said, okay, this intermediate format, that's our query language, it makes it way less work for us as implementers of the system. Have we open sourced it? Have we open sourced it? No, we, ha we haven't open sourced it. If there is a strong demand for it, it's something that we might consider in the future. Um, but as of this point, it's not on our, our roadmap. Yes? How many people inside um, Uber are actually using AQL? How many people inside of Uber are actually using AQL? Directly, uh, I would say south of 100 at this point. Indirectly, uh, almost everyone in the company um, in the form of accessing internal data tools that you know, issue their queries using AQL. But the, the end user doesn't actually interact with AQL itself. What percent of Spark do we use? What what version of Spark? Um, so we were using, I believe, up through one six, um, and before we sort of migrated Spark streaming off. And I believe that with the, the batch operations, we're using 2.0 at this point um, for those jobs. 2.1? Yeah, OK. So the case 2.1 comes with the tungsten, right? The question is, wouldn't using Project Tungsten be much more efficient than the, the Golang uh, maybe. I mean, we would have to actually run tests, and at this point, 
you know, we have something that's that's working that we migrated onto because the existing solution wasn't. Um, and until the current solution we migrated to stops working, there's not a huge benefit to, for us to go, try and go back and, and spend time testing that and tuning it. Um, there's just a lot of there's a lot of complexity around Spark. Um, you know, we've we've been bitten by, for example, the the locality, like how locality um, works around task assignment. So we, we, the, if you pull up the slides after this talk, um, there's a link to a Jira ticket that we filed where if one of your executors ends up with a, a higher locality to, to the actual driver than all of your others, um, and the task completion time is relatively short, none of your other executors will ever do any work. You'll have one executor out of your, like let's say, 32 that's doing work, and the rest won't ever do anything. And basically, the, that ticket has sort of just remained dormant um, you know, sort of since, since we filed it. Um, and it's, it's really hard for them to fix, because the way that, that the, the sort of locality-based um, locality task scheduling works is not designed for the sort of Kafka streaming use case. It's designed for like your standard batch Hadoop use case. Can you repeat louder? How do you solve cache invalidation? How do we solve the cache invalidation problem? So we maintain a mapping of understanding how far back in time data actually gets modified um, for a given topic relative to, to now. So let's say that like the P99 of like relative time um, for that that a trip comes in at versus when it was requested at is like six, 16 hours. We make sure that we re recompute um, that relatively frequently. We also have some tooling for sort of understanding the relationship between a query pattern and the cache keys that compose it so that we can then delete things from the cache. Um, but it's something that we, that's hard and that we sort of want to uh, improve upon in the future. Did you run into any challenges with uh, network I.O. bottlenecks between components in the system? Did we run into any challenges with network I.O. Um, between components in the system. Yeah, so we tried out Amazon at one point and basically overloaded our pipe from Uber's data center to Amazon. Um, and so yes, um, without going into too much detail there. How many events throughout the day do you How many rows in the data set? How many rows in the data set? In the, I would, uh, yeah, I mean, in the billions at this point. So those uh, stats of the queries when latency is like in milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, they scan like around billion events per query? So it, no, those don't. So the reason that we have such low latency for a sort of sub P95 is because we're able to ensure like a 90, 90-ish percent full cache hit rate through the contract runner by understanding what queries are, are likely to be run and running them sort of ahead of time with, with group buys. Um, and, the, and then we have about a six to seven percent of partial hit rate where it's queries that we haven't pre-run uh, the, the full thing for, but someone else has run it you know, recently enough that we didn't get a full miss. And then you're only querying for sort of like the recent tail on those. Uh, and then it's like a two-ish percent sort of full miss. We're done? Good. Hold the okay. questions. Okay. Take those off. Thank you, everyone. So we need to set up for the next presenter, please.